So, okay, welcome to today's lecture. So on Tuesday, we talked a lot about how you can make your data clean and tidy. Um, we first talked about missing values, what kind of semantics they had, how they are represented by either these not a number value or just by none, and then how you can find out where you have missing values in your data and how you can uh, deal with them that you can fill them with different values or you can just ignore them and how you can calculate with them. Then we talked a bit about duplicates and then largely about uh, the format of tidy data. So again, just to recap this, we learned that a tidy data set should have all the variables in the columns and all the values in the rows such that each row represents an observational unit that belongs together and yeah, if you have data like this, then it's very easy to process later on. Then we learned about all the problems that can go wrong when you have tidy data, and we learned about methods, uh, how you can deal with these uh, failure modes of uh, data being cleaned up, so that you can melt down data if you have uh, variables in the, or if you have values in the columns, and how you can use then, let's see here, vectorized string operations to uh, manipulate uh, uh, columns that were abused uh, to store multiple variables in there. Uh, you can efficiently use vectorized string operations for such cases. And then um, how you can deal with the opposite case if you have variables stored both in rows and columns that you can pivot your data to return data that is now in the rows back into columns, so back into variables. And then, yeah, finally we talked about uh, the methods and semantics of merging or joining data. So as explained last week, this comes largely from the semantics of relational databases that you have like two tables and then you want to join them together. So you want to combine the rows that belong together based on some join key, so based on some criterion where you think these rows, uh, these tables should actually match, and then you say, okay, wherever this is equal, I will combine the rows, and then there are different modifiers to join things together, so you can make an inner join to only combine the things that are totally equal, or you can make a left join to append everything from the right that fits, but keep everything from the left, even if, it's, if, it, even if it, it has no counterpart on the right side, and just fill the uh, previously created cells here with uh, missing values. And the same you can do from the right. Or you can do a full outer join where you combine everything that belongs together but still keep everything from both sides that does not belong together. And then we learned how this is implemented in Pandas just as the merge operation uh, that you can simply merge data frames but you should most of the time should specify on what kind of value or variable you want to merge actually and that you can merge either on columns or on uh, indices and that you can also deal with the case when the columns have different names and so on and so on and that this is like gives you the opportunity to separate data that does not necessarily <coughs> necessarily belong together uh, into two separate tables and just keep the the merge keys and thus thus reduce the size of your data dramatically and don't repeat your data unnecessarily so that was that and so this brings us to uh, the problem of one type of observation being in multiple tables. I'm not sure this is now not defined, so I need to get um, back here for now and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is like, I would say, uh, the, the easiest case of untidy data. Um, it's just like if you have one type of observation in multiple tables, it means usually scattered across multiple files. Or then you need to do usually is, uh, so we see again, okay, this was a tidy version of our uh, few data set here. And then uh, we look at the directory where now uh, where we stored now uh, separate versions of those or separate parts of this uh, data set. 
So in this case, let's assume that for each uh, religious group that we have here, we would have just our own table. Then if we look at, for example, single one, then it looks like this, that we now have uh, the income groups and the counts in every one of those uh, data sets. And so to say, the variable or the information about the religious group is just stored in the uh, file name in this case. So this is also a data format that you often encounter, but this is like really the easiest one. So in this case, just for completeness, all you would need to do is you would gather all the files from the file system, then you would uh, read them in, in pandas, and then you would just uh, uh, keep all the, or just collect all the data frames in a, in a list and also collect uh, the new uh, variable that is only stored in the file name separately. And this would give us like uh, a list of data frames. So if we look, try to print out the whole list of data frames, which is called TFs, it's a bit unreadable. But let's maybe just look at the length of that. So we see that we have now 18 different data frames in our list. So and a single one looks like this. And since we already did this, we already have the religion here on, uh, uh, as a column already. So and then all we need to do is we need to concatenate all those data frames. So in this case, we can just call pdconcat uh, conveniently. And we say, OK, give it, you give it a list of uh, iterables of data frames. So usually just, yeah, you just iterable of data frames, so usually just a list of data frames. And then you can say also ignore the index. So a new, a new index would be created. And when we do this, we get back our original data set uh, in the tidy fashion. So just that you've seen this once uh, for completeness, but it's actually really, isn't really any special methodology. It's just like reading in all the files and then concatenating them and combining them in one large data frame again. So and this already brings us to our last, uh, in this case, very uh, small topic, which is removing outliers. So what might often happen when you collect data is that uh, there's some measurement error or whatever, and you have outliers that do not make sense in your data. So let's assume we have some data set that looks like this. Uh, we just like have some random uh, variables distributed here, so from a normal distribution, which uh, with a huge standard deviation of 90. So and then uh, there are several ways to deal with those outliers. Like there are also special detection algorithms that you might know from the machine learning lecture, where you can say, okay, if this and the statistic is applicable, then you might, uh, this value might be considered an outlier, or you can iteratively remove outliers or so. But just that you've uh, seen this also, there's, uh, so the simplest way to do is simply say, okay, uh, I believe that my data range is only uh, sensible from, let's say, one, minus 100 to 100, and everything above that doesn't make any sense. So what you can do is then you can clip your data and just say, okay, data.clip uh, with a lower and upper value. And when you then plot your data, uh, if the value is over this point, it will be just uh, cut down to the uh, lowest point that we specified as our bounds. So this is just like a really a rudimentary way to deal with the outliers, but sometimes like for a quick analysis can make sense. Also, if you have like uh, just, for example, negative values that you do not expect to be there or so, and then you don't just discard them and say, okay, this is the nearest value that I expect to be there. Okay, so with this, uh, as announced also last week, this lecture will be very short, so we have a lot of time to start with the homework. So there's again a full tutorial that you can view on YouTube if you're interested in learning more from SciPy 2017. There's probably also one from 2018. So there's a full tutorial on uh, data analysis with pandas, also including a lot of the examples that you saw here. And then there's also a chapter in the uh, Python Data Science Handbook that you can read that relates to topics here. And there's also the paper of uh, Hadley Wickham about tidy data. Maybe just can take a look at this. So, okay, this is not the very, uh, here's the paper actually. So this is also a nice way to publish your research if you are more like into writing software than maybe performing experiments, and if you have some open source software, it's totally viable nowadays to publish that in a, in a software journal. So there's this Journal of Statistical Software where I think like uh, this is published in, and nowadays there's also a new form called Journal of Open Source Software where you can just, if you have a GitHub account, uh, not a GitHub account, a GitHub repo where you have some software, you can simply 
uh, write a markdown file which describes what your package does in like two pages and then you can ask them, okay, I would like to publish this and you will get a review and if everything uh, is uh, meets up the standards then you will get a, a basically a published paper for some software that you wrote. So if you ever feel like it, I highly encourage you to do that. Okay, and with this, uh, we have also, so the, home, the actual or the most recent homework is still up because of the midterm exam, so people ask me, uh, ask, ask for a, a prolonged deadline. So the deadline is now Saturday at 12 a.m. And so, all right. Yeah, and uh, the new homework is also up, so let's just take a quick look at this. Homework seven, where we will deal with the uh, Ebola data set again. So this is how the data set looks. We already presented this in the lecture uh, last Tuesday. And now you have the following task. You should fill in the missing values So and use this uh, uh, forward fill and backward fill operations that you learned, or just a forward fill and then also filling things with, uh, with uh, statistics values that you computed on the data. Um, then we have the problem of uh, column headers that are uh, actual variables so that you should melt down the data set and tidy up the data set so it looks like this and each row was now actually an observational unit where you say, okay, on this date, on this day, I observed this count of the status in that country. And then finally, you will practice uh, merging and joining data frames a bit by computing the average population density for some American states here. So you will be given three data frames, so one that, lo that looks like this, where you have, okay, you have a short code for the state, and you have some ages, the year where the data was collected and the population count from that state. And so, okay, we have the under 18s and total were collected separately. Then we have some information about the size of the different states. And then finally, we have uh, information about uh, which state name actually means which short code. So what this means, what you then will need to do if you want to compute the average, uh, or if you want, want to compute the population density, you will need to somehow join the, this data, how large the states are, to the data uh, of the population. And to make this uh, relation, you will need to go through this data frame so you could first join this data here, and then you join this data here, and then you will have everything side by side, and then you can compute the population density. Okay, so with this, I would say you can get started. Uh, the link is on StudIP to accept the homework, and uh, if you have any questions, then yeah, please, uh, I'm here to assist you. Okay. <coughs>